go. Let's go. <clears throat> okay. Hi, Joel. Hello, Tavis. How are you? <laughs> I'm really good. It's good to have you in the, uh, the Modern Puritan podcast studio. It's good to see you again. Yeah. Now, uh, this is going to be a shorter edition than normal. And I'm saying that for the sake of our listeners. Because usually we have people sit here for an hour and a half, two hours. But uh, you're a busy man. And we have other things to do. And more to the point, we specifically want to talk about this book right here, which I'll show to the audience and <clears throat> and then read out loud. But this is a uh, volume 14 of Owen's works, which you were the editor on. And this deals specifically with uh, apostasy of, from the gospel. Um, I, I just have a few questions for you about the book, and you're, you're happy to mm -hmm. talk at length as you wish about any of these. But um, let's start with kind of the origins, is what, what brought you to this book as editor? Crossway. <laughs> <laughs> so they, they asked me to do volume 14. They're actually doing a 40-volume work of Edwards. Uh, oh, sorry, of Owen. So the 40 volumes include the 16 original volumes that... Um, the Banner white Truth, and green covered? Yeah, yeah. Banner Truth have done, and the seven volumes of Hebrews. So that's 23. You notice the volumes are a little thinner, so that probably pushes it up into 30 in equivalent, mm -hmm. or 35. But then they've also found, Crawford Gribben has also found, and he he's... He turned that over, I believe, to Crossway, some unpublished writings of John Owen. So that's very exciting. Yeah. But the second reason why they're doing this set is because <clears throat> they want to publish every work of Owen in a very professional style with, uh, with the apparatus of, of footnotes so that when you read Owen and you come across a figure, a name, uh, a difficult word, that's footnoted. Mm -hmm. So that was... Part of our task, I say our task, because Ian Turner assisted me uh, quite a bit, to come up with the right modern equivalent, and also to say he he references a certain person probably a couple hundred times. Then you don't only just write the person's name in full and, and and the dates of their birth and death, which need to be done. But you also explain in a sentence or two mm -hmm. who this person is and mm -hmm. why, how it relates to this particular passage. So it makes Owen easier to read, and you understand him more in the in the context. And then they wanted a seventy page, I think it was seventy pages, uh, introduction, like why did Owen write this book? What's he actually saying? And in apostasy, particularly, they wanted the historical context. Mm -hmm. Who is he writing against? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. why is he doing this? So um, going back to the the definitions that are footnoted, are those contemporaries of Owen's, his interlocutors, are those words that we would today consider archaic or maybe they've, the meaning has changed a bit? It's twofold. It's archaic words. Mm -hmm. But it's also just just difficult words for. I mean, Owen's a pretty complex writer, so sometimes he uses words that are still in the dictionary today, but nobody knows what they mean, or very few people know what they mean. Mm -hmm. So we're just trying to help the reader that way. Yeah, you mentioned a particular individual who's mentioned a few hundred times. No, no, not a particular individual. But oh. I mean, there's there's a couple hundred names here okay. in the footnote apparatus now. Of explanations of, of who people who people are. Does that include? So, um, so here's Julian, for example, three thirty one okay. to three sixty three, a Roman emperor, and there's a whole paragraph uh -huh. that we put in there about who he is. Okay, okay. So there's, for example, some of the church fathers might be mentioned, or oh sure, yeah, even uh, other contemporaries of Owen's that yep. people might not be familiar with. Yep. And does does Owen use uh, shorthand to refer to them? Was that kind of part of the task for you and Ian? Was Finding out um, who exactly he was talking about. Owen is not as difficult as some some people of the era where they just abbreviate people's names. <laughs> he actually gives you the full name, but doesn't tell you who he is. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so for this 
volume that you did, was your point, main point of reference the Banner of Truth volume, or were you actually accessing original manuscripts from both? Owen? Okay. Both. So you're, yeah. you're, you're really looking carefully, making sure that every word of the Banner of Truth one is accurate and correct. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it, it was pretty accurate. So this is very tedious work. I was going to say, because normally the, you're, a, you're an original writer. Yeah, but again, Ian Turner helped me quite a bit on this part, and, and, and he helped me with the intro as well, but uh, the intro is the fun part. That's where you, where you write the, you know, you summarize what the book is mm -hmm. saying, and you relate it to people today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that, that's, that's what we did. So, so Owen, I first, when I opened the book, I thought, man, I don't know. I've read a lot of Owen. I've never read his apostasy before. And I think this is going to be kind of boring mm -hmm. because apostasy. But it's anything but boring. So what Owen does is he distinguishes between total apostasy and partial apostasy. Interesting. And actually, most of the book is about partial apostasy. Would we call that like nominal Christianity today, or is it different? You, you could. Yeah, that's one part of it backsliding into nominalism but he's he's got a the whole book is about different kinds of apostasy um, when you begin to wean yourself off of your daily devotions mm -hmm. you're already going down the road of partial apostasy or you're there already uh, and, and he's warning you to be full bore for Christ yeah you know white hot flame for Christ yeah uh, the Puritan definition of zeal. Um, and so he's got um, just a whole section that is just very moving, very convicting. Um, for example, he um, you can have apostasy, he says in chapter 11, from, from gospel worship. So you're going to church and your heart isn't it like it used to be, and you're starting to get a little critical of the minister's sermons, and mm. you're not really taking the sermon, applying it to your life. You're already down the road of apostasy. Or um, he gives you two chapters, chapters 12 and 13, of how to avoid apostasy, how not to backslide at all. So it, it's really a book about backsliding. Hmm. as well. And then he has all these um, uh, chapters on apostasy from gospel holiness, living a more careless life. And you know the typical thing today. People say, well, you know, I can't, I can't always be over-righteous. I, I know this is wrong, but I'm just going to go out and do this anyway. Hmm. Hmm. Owen would say, what? <laughs> you, you're going to purposely go out and sin? This is apostasy. Yeah. You see, so that's chapters eight, nine, and ten, which gospel holiness he lumps in with gospel holiness, obedience, obeying intentionally, conscientiously obeying the Lord and His will every day, and that becomes a a lifestyle choice. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do God's will no matter what my feelings say. Um, that's interesting. I'm sorry to interject, but it's interesting sure. because it means that what we often call disobedience. I've never heard anyone talk about that in such strong terms as apostasy. Yeah. Like we think of apostasy as something uh, like falling away completely from the faith, proving you were never a Christian. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But in the Puritan mind, uh, it's not only, it's not only Owen, by the way, uh, Thomas Goodwin wrote on apostasy as well. And doesn't quite lay it out like, like Owen does. Owen is really focused on, you know, you slip back an inch, it'll soon be six inches, and then a foot, and then three feet, and then you're in danger of apostatizing altogether. Mm. Um, so interestingly, I, I, I love this section, Apostasy from the Doctrine of the Gospel, five chapters. Um, and he says, uh, here are some causes your own spiritual darkness, your ignorance of gospel truth. He, in another chapter, he deals with your pride, your vanity of mind, your sloth and negligence, your love of the world. So 
um, you can see he's, in a sense, in kind of an inverse way, it's a book on sanctification. Mm -hmm. You know, how not to slip back and how mm -hmm. to maintain a close life with the Lord. What is it about Owen himself as, as an individual, for those who aren't familiar with Owen, um, what, why was he qualified to speak on this? Well, it came out of a burning heart uh, because he wrote this book in 1676 between the time of the restoration of the monarchy, 1660, and William and Mary's Act of Toleration, 1689. And in 1662, you recall, um, after the restoration of the monarchy, there was an insistence by the monarchy on total conformity to the, to, 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 to the Anglican rules and, and the prayer book and so on. And that's when 2,000 of the major Puritans abandoned their pulpits and said, we can't, we can't, we can't do this. So we, they preached their farewell sermons and they were gone. Well, that sucked the air out of the room in terms, or the oxygen out of the room in terms of the, um, the Puritan movement because so many Puritans weren't preaching anymore. And so where did they go? They just stepped well, away? Well, some of them became <clears throat> lecturers in Anglican churches, and, and they preached on Sunday night and Wednesday and held the congregation <laughs> together for the poor preaching Anglican <laughs> who preached only on Sunday morning and, and did the pastoral work. So, yeah, some of them found positions. But by 1689, when William and Mary issued the Act of Toleration, Puritanism was gasping for breath, mm -hmm. and the movement really died around 1700. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was it was it was on a ventilator in 1689 already. So Owen is writing in the middle of this period. He's seen the churches go down. He's seen them apostatize. And what is his position at this time? What is he doing day to day? Well, Owen himself. Yeah. Oh, he's got. He's had all kinds of positions of leadership, but then he fell out of favor with, with Cromwell. And so now he's, he's, this is the period where he's really producing a lot of books. So he's doing a lot of writing. A lot of writing. Yeah. 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 So he, this is, in a way, it's a book that relates to us today very well, particularly with the, the footnote apparatus when you can see how it relates. But in his own day, this book was, you know, a contemporary book. So like David Wells putting his finger on the pulse of the problems of the evangelical church today. That's what this book is doing mm. in his own day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So he's writing against Roman Catholics. Yes. He's writing against Arminians. Oh, yes. <laughs> Always take a pot shot at them. And he's writing against Socinians. And Socinians are gaining the upper hand by the, by the 17th, 1700s. And of course, the winds of enlightenment are are not far behind. So he's he's discouraged what he sees going on in the church. The the high bright days of fervent godliness of the Puritan movement are waning. So apostasy is a natural book that needs to be written. Yeah. So period of time. Just to clarify something, because honestly, just reading the title, and I know this happened for me, and will probably happen for a lot of people, is they think. Oh, that's just Owen writing against the Roman Catholics, right? Whereas yeah. it sounds like you're describing it quite differently where, yes, he does talk about these major movements and that main church um, body, but actually, well, you tell me, is, is the majority of his time actually spent on kind of that boots on the ground, the, the people who consider themselves Christians, maybe they're part of the Puritan movement and within this reformed stream, like he's not just going after the Catholics. No, no. He's going after the Catholics, Arminians, Socinians, and a little bit the Quakers, but his main purpose of the book is to shore up those who, mm -hmm. who, have, who have known what it is to live vibrant faith in Christ. Mm -hmm. don't, don't be moved by all these false doctrines and don't move away from the pure gospel. Live the gospel. Hence, apostasy from the gospel. Mm -hmm. Don't backslide. 
be strong, even though we live in dark days today. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's the point. So by having this 70-page introduction, Tevis, um, and right away, I think even on page two, yeah, on page two already, um, I'm saying uh, Owen makes a pastorally insightful distinction between partial apostasy and total apostasy. He calls it stumbling versus falling. Mm. Uh, in his treatise, he combines his concern for the church's purity of doctrine, holiness, and worship with his skill in dealing with the inner struggles of the Christian life, the ever necessary struggle, the fight against sin, pursuit of growth and godliness, so as to leave no Christian reader self-assured that he or she is free from the danger that apostasy constantly is presenting. Hmm. So he's saying, he's saying it's, it's also an experiential volume where you examine yourself, yeah. Yeah. and he's saying, um, are you sure you're not part of the problem? Mm -hmm. And here's how you can be sure that you will not become part of the problem. You've got to mm -hmm. stay close to the word. You've got to be in the means mm -hmm. of grace. You've got to be determined to live in gospel obedience and holiness, um, that type of thing. So it's, it's a book that far, far, far more than I thought when I first opened it, because I wasn't very familiar with it, actually. I read all kinds of stuff by Owen, but I just never was drawn to this book. Mm-hmm. And when I got the assignment, I thought, oh, that's the book they gave me. <laughs> <laughs> but but it, actually, it, it's a wonderful book to read. And I'm hoping that the 70-page intro, setting in the historical context, and then I, I end the introduction by talking about uh, all the practical applications to today. Mm -hmm. I hope people read that first. I think if you read it first, then um, you'll find you'll find. Owen's book much more captivating, and mm -hmm. you'll enter into it under the conviction this book is really going to examine me. This is going to be good for my spiritual growth, mm -hmm. as well as understanding the battles of Owen's day. Yeah. I'm curious to know if during your work in Owen's actual writings, for you, Andy, and did you pick up a sense that this was also Owen's personal journey and struggle? Like, the, he was having to resist the the pull of these other kinds of uh, hmm. unbiblical or anti gospel doctrines. Well, I don't think I don't think Owen was attracted at all to Roman Catholicism, Arminianism, Socinianism, or Quakerism. But um, yeah, you can't read Owen um, on temptation and sin, for example, mm -hmm. or mortification. Mm -hmm and not come to the conclusion he's talking about the battles going on in his own soul. Yeah. And he wants to um, fight sin with all that is within him and wants other people to do that as well. Mm -hmm. The beauty of Owen is he exemplifies this, what he's promoting here, that with your totality of your life, you live fully for the Lord. And you beat back through the Christian armor of Ephesians 6, through the positive use of the spiritual disciplines, anything that opposes that full orb living to Christ, mm -hmm. which is which is typical Puritan, but it's the Caleb spirit. He yeah. followed the Lord fully. Yeah, you know, and so the the, the Puritans were always calling people to self examination because God hates a half hearted Christian. Mm -hmm. If you're lukewarm, I'll spit you out of my mouth. Revelation three, mm -hmm. you know, so. Uh, the Puritans are saying this, and Owen is on the fore foreground of these. If God is real, then you, you owe your whole life to him. And he gave you your eyes. Be careful what you do with them. You owe an account on the day of judgment, what you, what you did with your eyes. Use your eyes for the glory of God. Mm. So, ditto, ears, hands, feet, soul. Take my life, Lord, and... And let it be consecrated wholly to thee. Mm -hmm. That's the that's the Puritan commitment to God. Yeah. And they don't call that legalism. They call that vibrant liberty. Liberty of living totally to God. Like like Psalm 116 says, um, I am O in our in our Psalter, I am O Lord, thy servant, bound yet free, thy handmaid son, whose shackles thou hast broken. Redeemed by grace, I'll render as a token my constant gratitude of praise to thee. Mm. 
So in the Puritan mind, and in Owen's mind in, in, in particular, true freedom is in being bound to God, his word, his law, his gospel. And the Puritans would say that applies to every area of life, actually. True freedom in marriage is being a, a one, I'm a, I'm a one-woman man. And I find freedom in that. Freedom isn't in being two women, man. man. <laughs> um, that, that's slavery to the lust of the flesh. You, so you, you're bound to God, but you find your freedom there because that's how you live to his honor and glory, which is the purpose for which God made you. I and mean, you live for the purpose for which God made you. You have joy. You mm -hmm. have freedom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you could title the work differently, would you, in order to convey what you're saying here better? Because again, this word apostasy, if it's not even used much today, I don't think, within even the churches, is it? I mean, we don't, I don't often hear people preaching about apostasy. It's kind of this word that you, don't judge me, don't use that for me. But the way, the way you've described Owen talking about apostasy in terms of disobedience, or as it were, this unraveling of the bounds, the bands of uh, slavery in the good sense to God as our master, and this unraveling that's happening slowly rather than just an immediate chopping away. Yeah. Well, I wrote a book on backsliding myself. It was the very first book I wrote, actually. That and Jehovah's Shepherd and His Sheep when I was 26, I think, 27. And I rewrote it. <laughs> I rewrote those two first books. Uh, I rewrote the backsliding book maybe five years ago. And I called, instead of calling it backsliding, I called it getting back into the race. Mm -hmm. um, Owen didn't have racy titles like that <laughs> <laughs> in, his, in his writing. But if you could do it today, if I could be an editor and abridge this book and modernize it, and Owen was sitting next to me and he knew our culture. I said, hey, John, why don't you call this book Getting Back Into the Race? I think he'd say, fine, because it, it is about, okay, you're starting to slip. You need to get back. Mm. You need to get back to the, the first things. You've, you're, you're leaving your first love, and get back. Um, yeah. Where, do, where would you say that this book ranks, for you at least, amongst the works of John Owen that you've read or is this the one, the one well, you've edited, only one you've edited, or yeah, I only okay. got signed one, and I think, if, in fact, I think there's forty different people assigned. Okay. I don't know if anybody assigned to him. Oh yes, Andrew Balich is assigned to two, so maybe a few people are doing two. But um, I'm I'm really happy. I'm honored to do one, but I'm really happy it's only one because I've got a lot of other writing projects that are mm -hmm. that are chipping away at me mm -hmm. and, and have deadline dates, and mm -hmm. so yeah, I'm glad I'm glad to be done with this, but it was. It was um, it was a very worthwhile thing to do. Do you think? Um, I mean, I'm sure the answer is yes, but that. But, oh, in terms of, I, yeah, I yeah, forgot sorry. your, ahead, your question. Um, in terms of Owen's writing, so uh, years ago, there are two volumes of Owen that just spoke to me mega, mega, in a mega way. The first is Volume Two, Communion with God. Uh, that that's that's a groundbreaking book. Mm. No one has ever developed the distinct communion with distinct persons of the Trinity in the soul experientially to the extent that Owen did in that book, 400 pages. How do you commune with the Father? How do you commune with the Son? How do you commune with the Holy Spirit? I learned so much from that book. Mm -hmm. um, I got to know my God better. And then volume six on Psalm 130, what an exposition that is. Uh, particularly his huge section on assurance of faith. I actually wrote a chapter on Owen on assurance of faith in my doctoral dissertation. And um, that was when I was 32. So I'm talking almost 40 years ago. Volume 6 meant a lot to me at that point. And then I like, even though it's a polemical volume, there's so little good stuff on perseverance of the saints. And Owen has a whole volume on that, written actually against... John Goodwin, 
who's one of the only Arminian Puritans, mm. um, and Owen, Owen takes him to the cleaners. But that's not why I like the book. I just like the book because it is so comforting in, in promoting the solidity of the Christian life when you're in Christ. Mm -hmm. Let's wrap this up with one more question. Sure. Uh, although I'm happy to keep chatting. Because mm -hmm. uh, this is fascinating, just what you're uncovering about this work. Will this, uh, will this work that you've done on this volume, or how will it inform your writing going forward? Well, I've been reading the Puritans for 56 years. Um, I think more than anything else, it just reinforces to me, first, how few people understand the Puritans. They're caricatured so badly here. Mm. This, is not, this is nothing in this book is legalistic. Mm. This book is concerned that you and I walk closely with our God. And that ought not to be a burden to us. If I love my wife with passion and zeal, and I cherish her, and I want to lead her the way, love her the way Christ loves the church, anything that helps me love her more, I welcome. And if I'm a Christian, and I love my God, someone who's saying, watch out, if you go down that road, you're going to backslide and become further away from God. Or if you're going to go down that road, you're going to go further from God. So go down this straight and narrow road of gospel obedience and holiness and live close to God, and here's how you do it. That ought to be welcome mm -hmm. to a Christian. Mm -hmm. I want to be close to my God. Mm -hmm. I want to avoid the dangers of backsliding. Mm -hmm. So the way that you've just described it is very interesting because previously we were talking in terms of obedience, disobedience, um, devotions, which is a whole other question I wanted to ask you about. Oh, they, they were doing devotions back then. Uh, their daily devotions, which you said. But everything that you've just talked about comes down to this one kernel of, uh, of relationship. And that's really interesting. So apostasy, mm. we can then define maybe most accurately in terms of our relationship with God? Yeah, yeah. And, and Owen does that, actually. You know, he takes that, that very frightening passage in the Scripture. I call it the Hebrews 6, 4 to 6 passage. You can taste the good word of God mm -hmm. and the things of God and, the, and even the Holy Spirit's working in you in some way. And yet, you, you, if you abandon that, you, you, if you apostatize totally from that, it, there's no way of repentance. So Owen, Owen is basically saying, the author to the Hebrews is not saying here that people will apostatize. It, he's using a warning because he goes on and says, you know, but I'm persuaded of better things of you. Mm -hmm. He's using a warning to say, don't even go part way this mm -hmm. apostasy because there's a danger you could fall all the way, but Christ will keep his people. He wrote a whole nother volume on perseverance. But we need the warnings. We need the warnings to keep us uh, in the way. Yeah. So it's like me when our kids were very young. We live on a very busy road. We drew a, 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 a like a two inch wide chalk mark across the driveway. I mean, a very bold mark. And I took each child to that chalk mark. I said, "Don't you dare!" I get down on my hands and knees, looked them in the eyeballs. Don't you dare cross that line. Do you understand? If you cross that line, you could go on the road. You could die. You could die. Never, never cross this line. Now, am I being mean to my children? Or am I loving them? Mm. Owen would say, I'm loving them. Mm. And he's saying, I'm, I'm going to draw some lines for you here. You know? Don't, don't cross these lines. There's a danger. You, you could keep going. Because ultimately, like in a marriage, you're slowly... Uh, forfeiting the, uh, well, the covenant, right? Yeah, yeah. And even, even, even the simplicity of, of, of his point on um, slothfulness, mm -hmm. it's just like a marriage where, where if you're not careful, you get used to each other, you get kids around you, you get busy. Guy's got his work, woman's got her work. 
you can become like two ships that pass in the night. Mm -hmm. So what do you have to do? You have to cultivate that marriage. You have to have times of talking together. You have to have times of walking together, times of fellowship, times of uh, how are you doing, my dear? How'd that sermon speak to your soul this morning? And you got to keep up spiritual fellowship in a marriage. Mm. And Owen is saying the same thing with, with your relationship with God. Uh, we're so good at taking the most sacred things in life for granted. We can take God for granted. And so we, we slip back and kind of get into this nominal relationship mm -hmm. with God mm -hmm. where we take everything for granted. We did our duty. We went to church today. But you see, for Owen, going to church and walking out the same as you came in is an impossibility because the Word of God is speaking to you. So either you will be hardened a little bit more or become a little bit more indifferent or backslide a little further, or you walk out feeling the consciousness of the presence of God and be, being brought closer to Him. Mm -hmm. There's no neutrality here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so on either side of that divide is either deepened relationship or apostasy. Yep, yep. That's a heavy word. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's the, that's the chalk line. That's the chalk line, yeah. but it's it's um, yeah, you know, D David prays in Psalm eighty six verse eleven, unite my heart to fear Thy name. You know, the Puritans preached a lot on that text. Unite my heart to fear Thy name, mm -hmm. and when we backslide even the smallest degree. We're moving away from that prayer. And we're, start to, we're starting to live in some way presumptuously. Mm. God Our, hates presumption. God yeah. hates a divided heart. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, last question, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> and this one's for the listeners. Is, um, and you can say it's this book, but where would you suggest people who have not read Owen or maybe want to get into this series of, uh, maybe it's a bit more accessible, by Crossway, where should they begin? Well, the moment that we're speaking together, this is the third volume out of the 40 that has been published. So there's so work they're not, to be not, done. They're not going in order from 1 to 40. Right. It's, so Andrew Balich did the first two, both on the Holy Spirit, and those, mm -hmm. are, those are very good, mm -hmm. very good as well. Um, so right now there's only three, three choices. That will change very quickly. I think what Crossway's doing is as soon as they get a completed manuscript, they put it in the queue, so the sooner you get it done, the sooner you get it, you get it printed. Mm -hmm. But um, if all 40 volumes are printed, uh, I always try to get people to begin with Owen by reading his book on temptation and mortification, that type of thing, on sin. Because mm -hmm. it's so simple, so probing. Um, that's a good way to start reading Owen. You don't. You wouldn't start with reading Psalm one thirty or, or or Volume two on communion with God. I don't think. Yeah. That that would be more for as you want to grow in grace. Okay. Okay. Joel, thanks very much for this, and uh, we'll pleasure. have you we'll have you back for more of these because just your wealth of knowledge, fifty sixty years of reading the Puritans, I'm sure we could sit here for six hours and talk. Well, I love to talk about the Puritans. <laughs> they've, they've been a marrow for my soul. And so yeah. all my life I've tried to at least keep one Puritan book going, even though I read a lot of contemporary books too. But yeah. I find that the Puritans do more for me spiritually so that I don't move in some degrees of apostasy mm. than any other group of writers. Mm. Good. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone.